Hello and welcome to the Woolly Mammoth Fibre Company podcast episode 8. I'm Emma, the um, owner and dyer and everything else are behind um, Woolly Mammoth Fibre Company. And um, yeah, so today's episode is a little bit about um, embracing a slower autumn, um, a few traditional recipes and um, of course some yarn, some whips, some FOs um, and just a few other random things. So as some of you know, Rufus had to go in um, to the vets for a little operation. He got neutered. Um, he is now all better from that. It was um, a long enough process to get better from but um, then just uh, last Sunday morning we came down and he wasn't uh, really feeling himself. He didn't get up to greet us, he wasn't eating any, he wouldn't take any treats from us um, and he was shaking so we had to ring the vet and go down to the vet on Sunday morning and she said his temperature was really really high, it was 105 and that he would need some more antibiotics and some medication. So he was feeling a little bit under the weather but he got a couple of jags and uh, he was um, feeling much better that afternoon. So um, he's almost finished his second course of antibiotics in the last two months and uh, I think he is feeling back to himself now. Um, a lot of you are always asking me what breed of dog is Rufus. Um, a lot of you think he's an Irish Wolfhound, but he's not. He's a Bedlington Whippet, which is a cross between Bedlington Terrier and a Whippet. Uh, that makes him a lurcher. Um, so a lurcher is anything crossed with a sighthound, basically. A Whippet, a Greyhound, um, or the likes. And um, he... He is one and he is quite lively sometimes but he's also a couch potato Um, once he's expended his energy he will sleep for an hour, two hours. Um, he does require quite a bit of exercise I would say. He's quite energetic but I like that he gets me out and um, walking around the town so he we would do like a 40 minute walk or so in the morning that's off the lead and then we would do another two 20 minute walks two 20 to 30 minute walks um in the afternoon and then another one in the evening so he gets approximately three walks a day so that's quite a bit of walking um he was he's really easy to look after um although he has recently developed some um habits which um we don't know how to train out so he is really really nervous at the vets and he will try to defend himself um from the vets um uh yeah we don't know where this came from but we are hoping that with regular um visits not just to get something done that he will uh, become less scared of the vets um but other than that he's a really good boy and he just does a lot of roaching during the day or he just comes and sits by me or he just looks out the window or sleeps or whatever so he's a really nice pet to have i'm not sure what else you'd like to know about rufus but if there's anything you'd like to know just um leave me a comment and I can reply in the next episode. So as you have maybe seen in the intro to today's podcast, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about embracing the autumn season. Um, for many years, if you had asked me what is my favourite season, I probably would have said spring, maybe summer because um, I really love it when you can see the first few flowers coming out and some colours starting to come in the garden um, and the evenings are starting to get longer and you're not stuck inside all the time. 
you get to be outside uh, in the fresh air enjoying the landscape more but for me this year I have had um, I've had a really busy year and I have got to the point now where I feel like um, I need to slow down a bit basically I need to do less and I need to focus on one thing at a time and just enjoy what I'm doing so um, this is something that's easier said than done and it's sometimes hard to put into action but um, I have decided to not have an update in September as some of you know um, I will be having updates for October, November and December um, and I have got to the I make a schedule for every like six months or so what I'm going to do for those six months so I made my schedule for um, the months up to January I think now and uh, when I sat down and looked at it I was like ah this is a lot of stuff so um, my husband looked at it too and he just said, Emma, you take on about 25% too much. And then when he said that, I realised, yeah, I do, don't I? And that I need to just rein things in a little bit. And I need to, because I, I really felt the need to have more time to explore new dye stuff, to knit more, to sew more, to just generally play and experiment more rather than just doing the same thing all the time. Um, which is what some things can feel like in a yarn business, especially wholesale orders. Um, so I needed to take a little bit of time away from all that stuff and give myself a few weeks to play around and just have some fun and just to give myself a bit of time just to do my knitting as well um, and also yeah I wanted time to do other things that weren't anything to do with my business I wanted time to bake, I wanted time to um, just do random things that you kind of want to do but never get time to do. So yeah, I'm trying to get into the mindset of embracing the autumn season and just to slow down and just enjoy it. I want time to go out and f forage things and make jam and just all of these things that harvest time and autumn can bring. So. Um, I think in the long term for Woolly Mammoth Fibre Company, I think that also means I have to keep it manageable for me. I never meant for it to get so big that I couldn't manage it myself and that I'd need someone to help me. It has kind of got to that point, but I'm not sure if I really want to go there with it. So um, that seems like contrary to the sort of advice you would hear anywhere in the world <laughs> any any other any business advisor any bank any people would tell you to grow bigger grow faster you know but I just that doesn't really sit that well with me so <laughs> that's not going to happen so it will always be what I I, w I want it to always be what I can manage by myself so that I'm involved in every step of the process from dyeing your yarn, at, from skirting fleeces to meeting farmers to dyeing your yarn, to labeling your yarn, to scheme, scheme, to scheme in your yarn, to processing orders, packaging orders, um, replying to emails. I want that all to be me but I want it to be manageable so um, there might be some more changes coming I will see how the next few months go but um, I think now that's where I'm headed and I think autumn really feels like a time where you're getting ready to not hibernate but you're getting ready 
to settle in and there's definitely a few things that I would like to do in my house as well as um, as well as all the things that I want to make and forage and stuff just to make it feel like a nice space to be in um, so a bit of time will be taken up doing that and I also just wanted more time to go and visit family and to not feel guilty about taking a day off in the week and yeah just things like that so I don't know if any of you who have your own businesses have had experience with that but I yeah it's been a really weird and interesting journey to get to this point because I never would have imagined it, it would have got to this point so that's really cool and thank you um, but yeah with that comes also a responsibility to myself to manage my work-life balance so that is my thoughts on embracing a slow autumn so, so on that note of embracing a slow autumn I also would I have some big ideas for my well big for me <laughs> big ideas for my winter making this is maybe the first year that I've really thought in advance about what I want to make for a whole season usually I just see a pattern that I like and knit it or sew it or I see a material and just make up something but this is really the first time that I've really felt the need to maybe it's part of the settling in or the the hibernation mode kicking in that I, ha I have this idea of what I want to achieve this winter just for myself personally so one thing that I would really like to get back into that um, I actually when I started Woolly Mammoth Fibre Company if some of you followed me back then you'll know that I had a few hand spun skeins in the shop um, I'm a spinner and um, obviously I can't do that anymore it's too time consuming but for myself uh, one of my um, dreams <laughs> for this winter um, is going to be to spin yarn um, for a jumper and to design that jumper myself. So I feel slightly ashamed that as a spinner I have never done that. I've just knitted smaller things with my hand spun maybe because a sweater um, takes so much meterage that it's a lot of spinning to do but um, I have an idea in my head of what I'd like to do. So I have um, a skein of yarn I'd like to show you. So this is some of my hand spun swiel deal. Um, so this is what I'd like to use for my jumper. I'm gonna get some more of this and spin it up. I kind of spun this in a, I, th I guess woolen spun, lofty woolen spun and I think I'm going to just use singles. And I'll probably start spinning the fibre for this sometime at the end of November possibly. Um, I just really love the natural grey shade, I'm not going to dye it. And I think it would create like a really nice um, jumper. I have, I actually found a, I'll show you. I found this book in a charity shop near where I live. And in it, it has various different things. For example, it has a section on designing your own jumper and um, it has different finishes uh, like neck finishes different um, 
yeah, so different neck bands. Um, it tells you how to take the measurements correctly and to swatch and all of these things. And um, oh yes, and different armholes and different constructions. So I'm going to use this as the basis, I think, for my winter self-designed um, jumper. So I'm very excited about that. Um, that is what that's going to be my main winter activity. I think it's probably going to take at least two months, maybe three. Um, so that will be quite indulgent. Um, that will be quite a nice long um, project to work on. Um, so that is my only winter mech implant at the moment, apart from this is all feels very higgly piggly today, but I'm just going to jump in with my other things and random thoughts. So last winter, you may know that I knitted um, a radari. This is called a, the radari sweater. Um, it's by an Icelandic designer whose name I don't know how to say, so I'm going to put it below. Fedisjonsson.de. I probably am saying that completely wrong. But, so I knitted this radari and I wore it every day in the winter. It was my warmest jumper. And um, some of you may know um, from my last podcast, I am knitting another one. Well, I have actually finished it. So, different colours. I feel like this suits me better. Um... I don't know what colours these are called because I threw away the ball bands, but I may be knitting another one of these because um, in the last few episodes or in a few episodes ago I, I told you that I was going to knit one for my granny. So I went down to her house and she, I had this sweater with me and she tried it on and she said, oh I love it so much, the colours are so lovely. And I said, well, why don't you just keep this one? And she said, oh, but I couldn't, I couldn't. And I said, just keep it. It's fine. I can knit another one. So this one is going to be for her. And I'm going to knit myself another one. Um, she originally wanted it in these colours. But when she seen this one, she preferred this. Um, so I'm thinking I'll knit another one of these in this colour or I might knit a soul bean, soul bean cardigan or I might knit another one of these in blues but so I'm not, I haven't really decided yet but I'm going to decide soon and then I can start to make it before my winter project. So this is going to my granny and that means I do have yarn in my personal stash to knit this so I was thinking of selling it because I'm not going to knit another one of these for myself in the same colour so I got enough to knit I think for a small although the last one I knitted I had a ball left over so you could maybe make bigger size so if you're interested in that send me an email through the contact page on my website um, and I can let you know, send you more photos and let you know the price and so on if you want to buy this. Um, not buy the sweater, buy the yarn for the sweater. It's Loppy, maybe I didn't say that. And the pattern is Radari. So that was all about the Radari <laughs> that's going to my granny. So I have one FO and it's apart from my radari of course and it's a sewing FO. Um, so this is my 100 acts of sewing t-shirt number one. A lot of people ask me what the name of my t the, my the pattern for my t-shirts are. It's always the same one it's 100 acts of sewing t-shirt number one and it's really easy it's just got a front and a back and I would really recommend the pattern so this is actually a wool and um, that I bought as an off cut when I was in holidays in Scotland and um, as far as I know it's woven in Scotland 
and um, at the moment it's quite chilly here so I'm wearing it over another like long sleeve shirt or polo neck or something like that so um, and yeah it's again it's in similar colors to this I think I'm I've got a kind of a an autumnal feel going here so that's my only finished object I have a few whips so I'll show you I'll show you my sold on the crop this I have been working on this for a few weeks now and I'm starting to think it might be too small so I don't like that <laughs> I think it should be a good bit bigger than this but maybe it will block out we'll see so this is, I'm knitting this in my Causeway yarn, um, which is all sold out now. Thank you so much everybody. Um, it was a great success and you all loved it. So this yarn um, came from about five miles away from where I live. Um, that's where it was grown. It was spun um, in Cornwall and naturally dyed by me. So um it's 75 percent tea water 25 percent oxford down and it's woolen spun so it's really um it's really nice to work with uh and when i gauge swatched it it came out really big for this so i had to size down quite a lot in needle sizes and now i'm worried it's too small but i think it will be fine hopefully so um, yeah, I'm really enjoying this pattern. I've never knit it colour work top down before, so because the radari is bottom up. So that's been really interesting, um, and yeah, it's just it's just quite nice to work on, um, and it's nice that you can try it on as well. So I'm going to finish this before I start my next radari. And for a little while now I've been feeling really like I wanted to start something kind of easy or small or just something something a little bit different than what I have been doing. I've been doing a lot of big things like shawls and jumpers. So it's in my Hannah Lisa Hafferkamp bag that I dyed the linen for have to um so I cast on a pair of socks at the weekend they are called the Rita socks and it's by Danielle George who is Little Bobbins I hadn't heard of this designer before actually and I found her pattern I think through Alex Collins designs um, so I cast this on and knit it about this much, realised it was too big, ripped it out, started it again and I still think it might be a little bit in the big side actually. But um, the pattern's coming out really nice so far and this is on my natural sock base. And the colourway is um, Walled Garden. Uh, this is a fairly new colourway and I'm really enjoying how it is turning out. I'm knitting it on a pair of new, or not a pair of, but a set of new needles by Liga. Um, it's their DPNs. Uh, they're wooden and these are 2.25 mil millimetres and they have like a big degree of flex. I normally knit on metal needles. And at the start this was a little discombobulating, I have to say. I wasn't used to it. Although I think I'm getting used to it now. But I think that may be why my gauge keeps being so off. <laughs> so I think I will be going back to my metal needles. Although these will be good for something, I'm just not sure what. Maybe mittens. Um, so yes, this is a nice pattern. As of yet, I haven't really memorised it. I don't know why some patterns I can and some patterns I just can't, but I really love the little stitch pattern. I think it's really pretty. Um, 
I got the needles at Woolen from I think the was it Cat and Sparrow? I hope I got that right. Cat and Sparrow stall. And um yeah. I hadn't seen that Lika do the driftwood DPNs before, so that was interesting. I also made a few sewing purchases more sewing purchases than I would normally but the main thing that I bought apart from fabric was this pattern which is called free range slacks and it's by sew house 7 they look a little bit like the 100 acts of sewing trouser that you can get um, but I really like this because they had a tapered version and I also liked it because they had pockets in the front and a pocket in the back and um, they had the two versions in this so I got this I'm hoping to try to make a pair out of linen I don't know where I'll fit this in maybe on one of my free random days so there's this or I might do it in more like a denim -y type thing I'm not sure um, these are the other purchases I made um, the pattern and these fabrics were from a shop local to me called Oh So and it's a really cool little fabric shop and um, it's quite close by to me and she just launched her website so I got these few things so I got this fabric um, she has a lot of organic cotton or um, got certified stuff <coughs> I just thought this was a really nice little print it's quite summery but I plan on making another one of my 100 acts of sewing t-shirts with this actually with all of this fabric and this one and also with this this is actually like quite a nice warm fabric it's like a terry terry fabric i'm not sure if that's actually the proper name for it but yeah all three are going to be t-shirts so that'll be good um just a note on using up scraps, I have recently been thinking about um, possibly researching how to put together a patchwork quilt because I do have quite a lot of scraps and probably quite a lot of the colours in it go together. I'm not a good sewer so I'm not sure if this is something that I'll be able to do or not but it's something that's been in my mind for a little while. So if you have any recommendations about how to go about that, I know the basic principles is you cut out the squares, you sew them together, there's a batten and then there's a bagging and then there's a bias binding around the, the whole blanket but I don't really know how, like what's the best size to cut them or like what do you use for a batting or is there any tips and tricks that I should know before I start. So yeah, do let me know. Um, as for yarn scraps as well, I have been thinking about trying to use them up um, in some sort of crocheted blanket, but the last time I crocheted was probably circa 2010 and I haven't crocheted since, um, so I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> So if you have some tips on that, I would really appreciate it. Any patterns that would be good or maybe I don't need a pattern. If you have a stitch that would work that I could research, I would really appreciate that Appreciate that as well. Um, so yes, a couple of other things. Uh, oh, one more thing actually in my daughter of a shepherd bag. Um, I haven't had this whip out for a while. I, it's been put on hold. It's knit in used wool. 
I'm just making up the pattern and I have been spending quite a long time trying to decide what I'm going to use, what type of border I'm going to do on it. So um, Mars of Hey Brown Berry very kindly sent, sent over uh, one of her patterns, the Ritual Shawl, which has a nice lace segment border on it. Um, I had a look at it but I think it wasn't exactly what I was imagining although I do really like it so maybe I will knit it, I don't know or maybe I'll just knit it on something else um, but in the book that I found in the charity shop it has a lot of borders and I'm thinking of and it has a lot of um, knitting stitches different stitches that you can use for different things so I am going to use I think this one for the last few rows and I might go to my white colour or my um our yeah because this is grey I have another another skein of this yarn in white so I think I will finish it off with that and that'll be quite nice in this So that is, I hope to have something done in this by the next time <clears throat> I podcast, maybe, maybe not, I might. We'll see how it goes. Um, and the last thing, yarny thing, that I would like to show you is um, my two new bases that are going to be coming to the shop, hopefully in October. At least one of them will be coming in October. And that is my natural sock DK. So this is a version of my natural sock um, in a DK version without the high twist. And this is it here. So this will be so perfect for sweaters. I haven't got a white DK base, so this is extremely exciting for me. And I hope to have quite a lot of this dyed up for the next shop update and because I don't have a white DK base that means that a whole range of my colours will um, come alive on this so a lot of the popular colourways like Party in the Common Room, Honeysuckle, um, The Walled Garden, Climbing Wisteria, I can do that all in this base and we can all make sweaters. I'm very excited. Um, I don't know which, what sweater I'll make or if I even have time. I mean, all my plans for knitting and making things, I don't know how much time I'll have, but <clears throat> that will certainly be on my list of things to do. So perhaps it needs a new name as well. Maybe it should be called Natural Sweater instead of Natural Sock DK. Um, but it's exactly the same makeup as my four ply. It's 50% BFL, 50% TV it, um, without the high twist, basically. Um, non super wash, nylon free, really, really lovely. I absolutely love it. The other base is one that I haven't revealed yet on. Oh, I still have my tag on from the yarn festival. <laughs> Just hide that in there. Um, and it is this, it is a new base I got from um, from a farm in Cumbria and it was spun in Cornwall and it is, let me get this right, 90% Shetland, 10% mule, woolen spun and um, I have about 150 skeins of this and once it goes I will never have it again. Um, because um, the farm doesn't have the Shetland sheep anymore. So um, it's really, really squishy, really woolly. Smells a little bit sheepy. Smells really good. And it's a two ply. Uh, what I mean by that is two threads make up the yarn. I don't think you can see that, but. Um, and I will have it in four ply and DK 
So good for sweaters, good for shawls. This will be coming to the shop hopefully in October, maybe November. Depends how I get on with my slow autumn. <laughs> Um, and this is what um, the four ply looks like um, knitted up. It's got a really nice fabric, but it's also got kind of a nice hold. Like, it's kind of drapey, but also kind of not drapey. It has enough crispness to make to for it to have some hold. It's like. It's really really nice it's gonna be so warm this would make the best sweater so I am very 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 excited <laughs> about knitting some of this for myself so um, I will be probably testing this out in the next few months along with my natural sock DK and I will let you know all how that goes so the next segment of the podcast is to do with food. Um, I'm going to start off very, very briefly with a book I bought. Let me just get it. Um, if you're here in the, in the UK or you have access to UK TV, some of you might have been uh, watching Nadia's Time to Eat. Uh, Nadia won the bag off a few years ago, I can't remember which one, but um, Nadia has a series on the BBC at the moment called Time to Eat and I've been raving about this series to everyone um, because it is so good. So um, with her series she has uh, this book so I got the book because I started watching the series and I thought this is so good. So the reason I really liked it was because she uses a lot of hacks like time saving hacks and unusual putting things together in a really unusual and interesting and yummy way and I really really um it just gave me so many ideas and really really inspired me and I just I like the way she thinks about food and the way she puts it together just think it's really clever and yeah she's really into like um, cooking like two meals at a time like bulk cooking or like using the same ingredients to make like two different dishes and it's really got me like into cooking and stuff again and plus Nadia is really cool and she rocks a pastel she really wears a pastel color so well like and her kitchen is beautiful lots of pastel bowls and yeah it's just gorgeous you need to watch it if you haven't already um yeah and she's just got some really cool ideas so i really recommend this book even if you can't watch the series i would get the book so a few days ago someone sent me a message on instagram asking do you have any traditional foods for you from uh, if so, can you share? Um, they, this person had a, a relative who was from my part of the world and they emigrated and they were really interested to know if there's any traditional recipes I could share. So I have actually recorded me <laughs> begging some soda bread. So I don't know if that interests you or not, or if you think it's really boring, but I'm going to um, include it um, in this video and also separately. Um, it's just a really, there's no recipe really, you just kind of make it up and um, I hope you find it interesting and I will hopefully do more, uh, just a few more random recipes from where I'm from. Um, in maybe at the end of every podcast for a few months or something. Um, so yeah, it's really easy, it's really quick and anybody could do it, there's nothing to it. So I'm gonna pop that in now. <laughs> So for this recipe you will need buttermilk and soda bread flour. 
that's it pretty much at the very least um, I would also recommend if you want to put something in it for example um, cheese or herbs or anything I would get that ready so I'm gonna get all my stuff together so the first stage is um, I actually don't have any buttermilk in the fridge so I'm going to make some because I do have regular milk and a lemon so I've never done this before so I hope it works so I hear you just put a bit of milk in Oh, and this is the Soderbergh flour. I don't know if you can get this all over the world or if it's just here you can get it, but I think you can make this as well with normal self-raising flour plus bicarbonate of soda. I'm not sure. I've never tried, but yeah. So the milk goes in. Um, the lemon or vinegar I think you can use goes in and it starts to curdle. And you leave it. to the side when you finish for about 10 minutes approximately um, okay so I'm just gonna leave this over here then um, you get your sort of red flour I've just got a table is that a tablespoon? I don't know, just a normal spoon that you eat cereal with. Fit in like, depends how much you want to make, but I wouldn't make too many. One, two, three, four. I'll just put in a wee bit extra. Five. And put a wee bit of flour on the baking tray, like so. I'm not very technical, as you can tell. So I'm going to put in mixed herbs, put in plenty so you can taste them, and some cheddar. And um, flour your knife. And yes, this is starting to curdle now, so this is nearly ready. It doesn't get as thick as buttermilk or as sort of gloopy, but that's quite good. So I'm just going to add a bit in. So basically, um, I don't really have a recipe for this. You just put it in until it seems right. So you just start mixing. So you don't want it too uh, gooey, but you don't want it dry either. And the reason I'm mixing with the knife is so that the my hands don't get all flurry in the beginning. Go for a bit more. This is actually quite thick, it's quite good. Very handy if you don't have buttermilk in the fridge. Oh, you need some lemon or some vinegar. Okay, so you want to just keep putting it in until it starts coming together like that. I don't know if you can see what that's like. So keep mixing it, doesn't need much mixing just until it comes together like so a bit more flour actually so I would say that's done so I have enough there to do some more another day so now it's time to get your hands in there So what you want to do is just put this in the baking tray, creating minimal mess. Just kind of slightly coat it in the flour, I always do that. 
and you want to make it into a kind of circle and then you need a knife for the next bit so this is quite a messy knife at this point but and you cut it like that and then like that and then like that and you've made Sudafarl and that's it ready to go in the oven I put the oven on at 180 although I not too high not too low leave it in until it's ready maybe like 15 minutes but you can kind of tell if it's cooked or not by looking at it and prodding it and sticking a knife in it so um, yep that's it all done